Welcome to Hope for Today, a weekly Bible teaching program that will bring you hope for every day. Thank you for joining us this week as we continue our study through Exodus. We are now about halfway through the book of Exodus. The rest of Exodus tells us what happened at Mount Sinai. God reveals himself to the children of Israel in ways they have never seen. They learn more about him and experience him at a whole new level. As we are going through this section of Exodus, don't lose sight of the big picture. Some of these chapters are filled with lots of small details, and sometimes we wonder why all this information is in the Bible. If you start to feel that way, remember where this fits in God's story. God is building a kingdom and he will redeem what was lost to sin. He will restore his kingdom in the whole world. We know the children of Israel go on and fall away from the true God, but from the children of Israel comes one called Jesus. Through Jesus, God will get it all back. God's plan will not be thwarted. His story has twists and turns, which don't always make sense to us. But remember, His heart is for the whole world to know him, and this will happen. Understanding this brings purpose to all the Bible because every part points to this end goal. The holy God of Mount Sinai has not changed. We must humble ourselves before him and join his team. Don't lose sight of the end when Jesus will be the king of kings, and we will have the privilege of serving this great king. I give you this short intro to remind you of the big picture. God's plan will be accomplished. He was working then, and he still is at work, despite how things appear. Thank you again for joining us here on Hope for Today. Let's go now with Bible teacher J. Mark for a closer look at today's lesson. The most important desire anyone can have is to do the will of God. But then we might ask the question, who is God? Can we know him? Well, I'm grateful to tell you that yes, we can know who God is. We can know him by the revelation he has given to us of himself in the Holy Scriptures. It is a true revelation, and we can base our faith upon it. And by that same revelation, we can also know what his will is for us. In his word, God reveals to us his will. He tells us what it is and how to carry it out. In Israel's experience, they discovered that in doing God's will, God was providing, guiding, and fulfilling his purposes through the promises that he made to them. There are lessons from the experiences of Israel for you and me today. And so we look at Exodus chapter 23 and verses 20 to 33 to consider this subject, doing God's will. That's Exodus chapter 23 and verses 20 through 33. Listen as I read. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto your enemies, and an adversary unto your adversaries. For my angel shall go before you and bring you in unto the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. But you shall utterly overthrow them, and break down their images completely. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. And I will send my fear before you, and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate, 
and the beasts of the field multiply against you. But little by little I will drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit your land. And I will set your boundaries from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. In Israel's experience, then, we find several promises which should encourage you and me to walk in the will of God. The first promise is the promise of secure control. So the Lord said to them, I'm going to send my angel before you. I believe in the ministry of angels. God has a ministry of angels for those who love and serve him. And in the case of Israel, he said, I'm going to send my angel to go before you, to keep you in the way, and to bring you into the place which I have prepared, the place which I have promised. And that guiding angel was to be with them as a constant companion. To me, that's a promise of secure control. God was going to guide them, protect them, and bring them to the place that he had prepared for them. But there's also a warning attached to this, a very important warning, because God said, Beware of him, that is, beware of the angel of the Lord, and obey him. Don't provoke him, because if you provoke him and refuse to obey him, he will not pardon your transgression. I was impressed with the statement that God made about this angel. He said, My name is in him. Now, some Bible scholars believe that this was an appearance of God himself. There must be more to this heavenly being than just an ordinary angel. This may have been God taking on a physical form to identify himself with his people, the people of Israel. And so he said, If you will do what I am telling you to do, obey my voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies, and I will be an adversary to your adversaries. God is saying, if you are on my side, I will be on your side. So you have a choice to make. You must come on my side, and then in response, I will come on your side. To Israel, God gave the promise of secure control in guiding them through the wilderness to the promised land. And then in the second place, there is the promise of secure constraint. Again, God warned them, You must destroy all the gods of all those other nations. You are not to bow down to their gods or serve them in any way. In fact, you are to utterly destroy them and not have anything to do with them. Overthrow them. Break them down. You see, God is a very jealous God. He spoke about that several times to the children of Israel. He is a jealous God, so he doesn't share his place or his glory with any other object of worship. God challenged the people, you must define your loyalty. You must make sure that you serve only the Lord God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he urged them, and the promise was that they would have secure constraint if they were willing to obey him. Then they would belong to him in a unique way, and they would be carrying out his will. Now notice verse 25. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I will take away sickness from the midst of you. God said, I'm going to supply your needs. You will lack nothing. When the people of Israel defined their loyalty this way, then God set a secure constraint upon them so that no evil would befall them. He would supply their bread and water, and their physical bodies would be blessed because he would take sickness away from them. And beyond that, even their animals would not be barren or give birth prematurely to their young. But everything would work out for his people, and their days would be fulfilled. In other words, their lives would be long. What a beautiful picture this is of God's constraint for his people who do his will. God's constraints are really good for those who follow him. We don't always see them that way, but God intended them for blessing to those who want to do his will. And then there's a final consideration, 
It is the promise of secure conquest. I want you to pay close attention to what God says next. This is God's promise to the ancient people of Israel. He said, I will send my fear before you and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come. Now, first of all, God expected to work through divine psychology. In other words, he would strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. He said, I will make your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets in front of you to drive out those people who occupy the land. So this promise of secure conquest would be fulfilled first by fear and then by hornets in verses 27 and 28. Divine strategy wouldn't drive them out all at once either, but little by little by little. God said, I'll not drive them out in one year, otherwise the land will be overrun by wild beasts, and then you will be at a disadvantage. So God had a strategy that he was going to follow in the secure conquest of the land which he was giving to them. And then the borders of that land are mentioned in verse 31. There were additional divine directives in verse 32. They were not to make any covenant with these nations or with their gods. They were to be there in the land in a unique relationship with God. Now, sometimes when you and I read these passages in the Old Testament, we wonder, why did God make those kinds of choices? But you know something? It's better for us not to argue with the Holy Scripture or to argue with the Lord. It's better for us to accept the fact that God communicated to us what he intended and what he was going to carry out. So the conquest of the promised land of Canaan was under his direction, and the conquest was secured if his people would only follow his plan and his program. No one can doubt what God wanted his people to do, because it's spelled out here for us clearly. No one can legitimately doubt who he was talking to. He was speaking to the children of Israel. But the question that you and I must consider is not so much what God wanted then and to whom he spoke back then, but the question is, how do you and I relate to God today? He is the God of Israel, that's true. He is also my God, and he will be your God too, if you will trust him. Doing God's will allows us to experience his promises of secure control secure constraint, and secure conquest. Believe me, God is on your side if you are on his side. So why don't you place your faith in him and do his will right now? Thanks, J. Mark, for this teaching on God's will. This is a big topic, and these insights from Exodus are helpful. We thank God for the promises found in his word. And we believe the key to knowing God's will is knowing Him. Two good ways to know Him are, one, through studying His Word, and two, by living life with other people who also know Him. We wish you success as you get to know Him right where you are. If you'd like a copy of today's teaching, or if you have any questions, here are a few ways you can contact us. The best way is through email. Our email is hope at heraldsofhope.org. If you don't have email, just write to us. Our address is Hope for Today, Box 3, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, 15533. Or you can connect with us on our website. Our website is heraldsofhope.org. On our website, you will find other resources, and under the Listen tab, there are other teachings similar to this one. If you go to the Connect tab, you can message us directly. Again, the website is heraldsofhope.org. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to being with you next week. Until then, go with God and enjoy growing in your knowledge of Him and living out His will.